I, I think your journey, it started with your spiritual journey, if we could call it that. It starts with uh, Joseph Campbell, is that right? He, you've described him right. as a mentor in your- um, Who was, yeah. you know, and most people don't know this, who was also an atheist. Yeah. Uh, most people don't know that. He was a New York atheist. Uh, and most people who come out of a, like Spengler says, um, a big world cosmopolitan city automatically produces atheists. That, that's, it's automatic. Um, and, and Campbell was. But he had this fascination with comparing and contrasting all the world's myths. And um, his services in that respect are unrivaled. And I don't even think his rival was the academic guy, Mircha Eliad. And uh, so Mir Mircha Eliad was doing the same thing in respectable academe that Campbell was doing outside of academe. Uh, but I think Campbell did a much better job and he knew myth better than Eliad. Sorry to have to disappoint the academics on this. He knew myth better than anyone. So Eliad did not know a thing about Native American mythology, for instance, not a thing. <laughs> and there's a, it's funny because there's a, there's a book of Eliad in conversation and he's talking to this guy and all he does is sit there and talk about all his awards, all his awards and scholarships and grants and all these things. He talks about everything but myth. Um, so the guy was on an ego trip, uh, but Campbell was the real deal. And the irony is that Campbell gets anathematized in academe, whereas Eliade, because he played by the rules, uh, does not. But Campbell knew way more about myth than Eliade. That's just a fact. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint you guys. That's just a fact. So. The only thing I've read by Campbell is this book, uh, Inner Reaches of Outer Space. And I read it quite a lot. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, that's really good. I enjoyed it. But to be honest with you, I can't recall that much. I actually thought I might pick your brains about Campbell because I know that you um, you researched him for a long time. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. He has this idea um, th that I've read about that myths evolve over time to sort of meet the societies. You know, the totem and the society parallel one another. So the myths in like a hunting and gathering society are very different from those in an agrarian society. Um, and I thought what you might do, I don't know if this is um, perhaps too big, but... Um, is talk about the evolution of myth. How does it change with society? Well, you know, um, starting with hunting and gathering and then the agricultural, and then perhaps even you could work your way up to today if you'd like. Yeah, it really does. It, uh, once the economic situation changes, the myths change along with it. Um, in a hunting and gathering society, uh, shamanism is the primary mythology. Um, the shaman is the one who goes out into the wilderness and he receives a vision quest and he has all these visions, animal beings might come to him and then he comes back to the tribe with these new ideas. Whereas with the agrarian world, now we shift into the world of the priest. And the priest is not somebody who goes on a vision quest. The priest has received a body of dogmatic wisdom that he just simply passes along. Um, that's what a priest does. And so, but the shaman is the courageous individual who goes out on his own and has to undergo ordeals like fasting, you know, or, uh, and has visions of his body being torn apart, put back together by the ancestors. That doesn't happen to a priest. A, a priest just simply learns the rites and the dogma and how, and how to put it together. Um, so they're two different figures and, and the priest anathematizes the shaman. And by the time you get into agrarian societies, the shaman becomes marginalized as the witch doctor, let's say, a witch doctor. You know, this is a guy who's in charge of spells and healing people, but he used to be the guy who is the primary religious figure who gave the tribe their vision. Um, so it does shift when, when you're talking about like the Paleolithic, uh, what, what Campbell calls the way of the animal powers. And then it shifts into the way of the seeded earth, which is the way of the soil, 
the mm. plants it's and so villages, gentle. villages now rooted to the soil. You don't move. Uh, the Paleolithic peoples are on the move because they have to follow the game. You know, they, they follow them across Siberia into the New World. They become the Native Americans. Um, they're always nomadic, but um, the way of the seeded earth is something that came out of the Middle East and it laid the foundations for high civilization because high civilization comes out of that with what Campbell calls the way of the celestial lights, mm. which is when now so much has accumulated with these villages and towns and astronomy studying the stars and being rooted in place. And pretty soon you have temples and priests who are studying astronomy and the stars and now civilization comes into being, especially with writing and mathematics, because you can't do high civilization without writing, without mathematics. That's not, you know, it doesn't happen. And so uh, the gods then shift from initially animals to plant beings, and now they're the stars. Um, every single one of the planets, like Inanna, let's say, is Venus. Uh, or Nanasin is the moon god. All the gods shift now to the stars and the stars do things that are absolutely mathematically predictable. They come around, you can predict it and uh, it, 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 it brings in fatalism. It brings in the idea that civilization is based on cycles now, cyclicity, things return eternally. And so we get, you know, what Nietzsche calls the, the eternal return. That's the next phase of high civilization. Mm. I would like to just um, rewind a little bit and talk about the Neolithic mythology. Um, do you, have you read much on um, Kim Butis? I know that she worked with Campbell. Yeah. Yeah. Because oh, yeah. um, you're talking about the earth. Um, and That's I right. believe that this is often uh, a symbol of the mother goddess. Is that right? Um, yeah, but most of the Neolithic societies are goddess worshipping, not all of them, but mm. most of them are. Yeah, And she has this idea, I believe, that um, exactly what you've just said, right, is, is that so you've got these goddess worshipping societies, and then uh, at some point you've got the Indo-European invasion, and then they move towards a more celestial worship during perhaps the Bronze Age is w when that occurs. Um, do you think that she's right in thinking that um, goddess worship is linked with a sort of matriarchy or do you think that that's um, wrong? Yeah, no, I think she's right. I, I think she is right. I think that a lot of the societies in the Neolithic uh, were goddess worshiping and did trace their descent from the mothers matrilineally. J.J. Bakovin was the first to figure this out in the 19th century. He was a contemporary of Nietzsche. Um, and he was the first in his book, Mother Right, to point out, he was a classicist, um, and, and uh, to point out that, hey, wait a minute, there are certain societies like the Lydians who trace their descent from the mother, as did the Egyptians. Uh, they trace their descent from the mother. Why, why is that? The Romans didn't do that. They traced their descent from the father. So there must have been an earlier stratum of mother right, where people traced their descent from the mother. And I think he was right about that. Um, and then when the Indo-Aryan invasions took place, Indo-Aryan, Indo-European, whatever you want to call it, uh, between 2000 BC and 1200 BC, they start coming down and uh, conquering uh, these native farming villages. You can see this like dramatized and popular movies like Kurosawa's The Seven Samurai, where they have to hire the samurai because the local farmers are being besieged by these horseback riding uh, nomads coming in. So they have to hire the samurai to, to protect them. Um, same idea, same idea. That's what happened. So these people came down um, and we should make a distinction here between two different uh, generations of civilization because the first generation the egyptian and mesopotamian 3000 bc comes in where none of that is an issue 
the Egyptians are already pretty matrilineal uh, to, to begin with. Um, the Sumerians sort of are and sort of aren't. It, it, it just depends on where you want to put the inflection. But that's the first generation that comes in 3000 BC to 2000 BC. Then those Indo-Aryans who have been up in the north between the Caucasus and the Black Sea, um, and, and even as far east as China, they're not Indo-Aryans in China, they're a different uh, ethnicity, but they're the same exact mentality. Um, then they start coming down. 2000 BC, they start coming down, starting in Egypt with the Hyksos invasion, which takes place 1700 BC. They come raiding in out of, the Sir, out, out of Palestine with uh, two wheeled chariots and the compound bow. And they just lick the Egyptians. They, they just fucking wipe their asses with them. And then they take over the north of Egypt, the Delta, not the south, but the, but the Delta. And the Egyptians are like, how do these fuckers do this? Oh, they have these chariots. Um, they, they have these chariots and they have these newfangled weapons, these bows. And so the Egyptians picked that up and they turned it around a hundred years later and they're like, okay, you guys are gone. We're Egyptians, sorry. And Kamosa and Amosa, these two brothers, just ch chased them out. And at that point, the Egyptians created their empire. They, they entered their empire stage by conquering all of Palestine to make sure this would never happen again. But that was just a harbinger because the, these, these uh, chariot riding nomads were, were just conquering everywhere, India, um, China, everywhere. They, they come down and they inaugurate the second generation of high civilization. China, Persia, India, Greece, the Hebrews. It's a whole second generation. And what's interesting about it in distinction from the first generation is that the second generation is philosophically inclined. Now we get philosophy. India, we get the, the Upanishads. Uh, in China, we get the hundred schools, most of which has been burned, uh, Lao Tzu, and Confucius and so forth. Uh, we get Pythagoras and Plato, you know, so we get this second generation that's philosophically inclined as the result of the fusion of these Indo-Aryans with these native populations who are just farmers who worship the soil and the goddess. Um, Gimbutas was right, totally right about that. So, yeah. Uh, could, you, could you compare and contrast um, their myths a little bit because we've obviously spoken about the earth goddess um, yeah. but now we have I, I think it, it's it's a instead of being a female a goddess it's a god and often he's depicted you know high in a mountain with light or fire um, I'm thinking maybe you could speak a little bit to that how are they different and, and what do we learn about these societies through these um, contrasting myths well just think of uh Hesiod versus Homer. In Hesiod's Theogony, um, we get everything coming up from the earth, from Gaia. Everything comes up out of the ground, as it were. And, but in Homer, we have Mount Olympus, and we have these gods who are at the top of Mount Olympus who are fighting uh, the Gaian monstrosities, and, and also in Hesia, uh, who are fighting them. And the guy in monstrosities like Typhon, let's say he's a half human with tentacle legs. Um, these creatures were the gods of the previous society. And so when the new society, the patriarchal society comes in, it devalues these gods and goddesses and thrusts them down into the underworld, into Tartarus, um, devaluing them in the process. So. The, the primary gods now live in a transcendental realm. And so with the male mentality, you get this idea of transcendence, of a transcendental mentality, where if you're talking about the female mentality, it's always immanental. It's always part of the earth. It's always growing up out of the earth like plants. Um, so that's what happens. And the Greeks are wonderful because 
when you read, let's say, Homer versus Hesiod, um, you get both. You, you get both mentalities, and you can see the stratum. And uh, even though Homer dates from a century earlier, I think 750 BC, then Hesiod, which is like 650 BC. The difference is that Hesiod was a landlocked Boeotian farmer. He lived in Boeotia and he's preserving incredibly ancient myths that Homer is not. Homer is bringing new stuff in. Homer comes out of Ionia, which is Asia, Asia Minor, and he is bringing in new stuff, new gods, the Homeric gods. It's a new pantheon. So if you read those two guys, um, Hesiod's myths are way older, way older by far than, than Homer. They, they are pre-Homeric. Uh, there's no question about that. What's the link between, uh, the link between like, a, obviously Christianity and Judaism, the Semitic religions, as opposed to Indo-European, and yet uh, they both obviously worship a sky father. Um, is there some sort of link between the two things? Well, there is a similarity because um, the Hebrews come out of the Syro Arabian desert from the south. The Indo Aryans come out of the north, the, the, the whole Siberian Black Sea steppe world. They come out of the north. But it's interesting, though, that they do have a similar mentality, and that's why both traditions have dragon slayer myths. Um, the Babylonians come in and conquer Sumer, and the Babylonians are, they're Semites, they're, they're Semitic, and they introduce some of the earliest dragon slayer myths with Tiamat, the slaying of Marduk over Tiamat, uh, which is a rejection of the astrological determinism of the Sumerians and their worship of goddesses. Um, so it's interesting, there, there is a correlation there between those two groups of people because, and here's why, it has to do with a socioeconomic structure that nomads are masculine. It doesn't matter where they come from. It could be Siberia, it could be the Syro Arabian desert, it doesn't matter, they're, they're nomadic. And as a result, uh, they're very fiercely patriarchal. They're polygamous. They all have multiple wives. Um, women are subordinate. And it's just the mentality of nomads. Mm. When people settle into cities, it's, it's a different story. It's, 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 uh, Ibn Khaldun has this idea in the Mukadima where he talks about how uh, the Bedouins and he, he himself, he, he prided himself on being descended from, from Bedouins. And he says, the Bedouins have this sort of mystical glue that holds them together called a sabia. Uh, it, it holds them together. But once they settle into cities, they degenerate because the, the asabia disintegrates and they lose that blood kinship. And then they start to degenerate into high civilization, which, which, which for him was regarded as total degeneracy. Mm. So it's interesting. So I think if you were, well, like the, uh, the racists would go and say, oh, in, um, these myths are unique to Indo-Europeans, Indo but you're saying it's more a feature of the nomadic lifestyle. It's yes, because you can't separate it from the Semites. They, they both have that same mentality and that's and what both. explains the attitude towards I, I think there's a quote in the quran and it says something to the effect of like the pagans worship females and it's weird it, it's in islam you almost see islam is actually almost more pagan than or it's certainly more pagan than christianity um in in the sense of um you you know very patriarchal very um and obviously you're allowing multiple wives and that's maybe a feature of that Bedouin lifestyle that you're talking about, that um, free lifestyle. Um, Nietzsche has this idea, and I know that you're um, very interested in Nietzsche, that much of what's happening now, uh, socialism, feminism, so on and so forth, that these are the consequence of 
a sort of return to a, like a pre-Aryan uh, mode of living or um, a feature of very settled life. That's essentially what's happening is we're returning to the earth. That's what's going on. Um, I don't know if you heard this or what do you think about it? Well, I'm not sure. I mean, I would need to know more about that. Uh, I, I think the idea is essentially like that uh, there's, there's, there's quotes where what happened was uh, Indo-Europeans, that nomadic life, they managed to inject some wildness into um, Europe. And the European city is unique because unlike China, for instance, it manages to maintain some of that nomadic life within the confines of a city. So if you're a Greek, for instance, um, you know, there's always an opportunity for um, adventure, right? In, yeah. in the Navy, in whatever. Um, and you could even think about, um, you know, the British Empire, any things like that. They managed to maintain within the confines of civilization some semblance of the nomadic life. And he's saying essentially what's happening now is um, we're returning to a more, th this more settled way of life. It, it represents a return to a sort of pre-Indo-European way of life, a return to the earth goddess, the mother, and that you can see that in certain modern movements. I don't know if that sounds too kooky to you, but it, it's, I, I find that interesting. It's an interesting idea. Well, here, uh, here's what I have to say about that. We're, we're not returning to a settled way of life. We're returning to a nomadic way of life because um, as the sea levels rise, and our coastal cities sink, we're going to have huge refugee prop, uh, pop, populations who are going to have no place to go. Mm. And so there, there are going to be, it's going to be a nomadic lifestyle uh, that becomes disconnected from cities. Cities mm. are locked in place. If you're in a city, you're locked in place. Um, but if that city becomes unlivable, for whatever reason, for climate change, for global warming, for sea, sea level rise. Even COVID, you gotta, you gotta people, get people are leaving the cities because I, I think people are, after COVID, lots of people are moving to, um, to the, the country. Yeah, that's the thing. So it's gonna cause a lot of nomadism, a lot of people on the move, looking for places to settle and yeah, it may then shift at some point back into an agrarian lifestyle. If, if people find places that they like and they settle there uh, in Siberia, let's say, or in Greenland, once the ice melts. Yeah, yeah, th they might find places to, to settle and then we might get the agrarian thing all over again. But I think we're gonna have to go through a major nomadic phase here before that happens over the next two centuries um so yeah that, that's that's how i see it i think that if i was to characterize your work i think the overarching interest that you have is essentially in civilization what makes a civilization healthy and what makes a civilization unhealthy right right um, right and i guess like now we're talking about that um we're talking about our current way of living um, most people have a weak view of history. They have a linear view. They think that things are either getting better if they're a progressive or worse if they're a reactionary. Um, but someone like Spengler, who you're fond of, has this cyclical view. Now, I want you to imagine that I'm, I'm like a wig. I've got, I think that everything is getting, getting better over time. Um, how are you gonna, how are you gonna convert me to the, to the cyclical view? How are you gonna convince me that what, what's going on right now is not just like unfettered progress. Because it's it's the same thing that happened at the tail end of Hellenistic civilization where you got atheism. So we're in the atheistic phase now. And then, but then that's followed by um, the building of gigantic works of architecture. That's a sort of uh, final sunset effect of the civilization. I, I think we saw that in the thirties with uh, the gigantism of the Empire State Building, the Golden Gate Bridge, the LA Aqueduct, um, all kinds of giant structures that came in. And then, but then after that, what you get is what Spangler calls a metaphysical turning toward death. The society becomes tired, it's weak, it's cut off from religion. You can only exist so long, the human brain can only exist so long without religion. 
So the society begins to exterminate itself from within and you get low birth rates. Mm. So the birth rates slowly start to decline. And pretty soon you start seeing places like uh, the Forum or the Colosseum with cattle grazing in the Colosseum, which, which is what uh, Spengler points out, um, that it, it, it just exterminates itself from within. It gets tired. It doesn't want to live anymore without uh, a, a spiritual vision. So it, it just dies down. And the thing about it is when it dies down, when you get lower and lower birth rates, then other people who have high birth rates are like, hmm, let's take a look at these people. You get the German barbarians then who come in swarming over the limeys and they're like, we'll take over this place. We're happy to live here. Um, so that is that is what is happening now. Um, yeah. Birth rates amongst whites are declining disastrously and precipitously. That's a fact. So, I mean, look that up. And it, it corresponds perfectly to what Spangler said. Yeah. Um it's interesting in terms of like the barbarians at the gate, um, you almost get the impression in a country like America that the barbarians are already within. Like you, you get this impression that uh, particularly in America, I mean, I'm not from there, I'm from Australia, but the impression that I get is that increasingly um, the regime, whatever you want to call it, looks at its own population, its military population, its police force, so on and so forth, and they start, they're beginning to view them as the potential barbarians. Does that make sense? I think yeah. it's hard yeah. to imagine. I, I struggle to imagine a country like China, um, economically, obviously, it'll attempt to influence America and conquer it in that way. But I, I struggle to imagine China sort of boots on the ground. That strikes me as an incredibly settled civilization, if that makes sense. I mean, the thing about China, though, that you have to take into account is that, yeah, the, um, the birth rate is always explosive there. Um, it, it's always explosive. But, but China always has this idea that we don't need you. Mm. We don't need you. We don't need you. We're fine where we're at. So they don't really have, like Islam does, yeah. like the West does, they don't really have this conquest mentality. That's exactly what I mean, yeah. I, yeah, so, so a lot of people yeah. are, are, are paranoid about China needlessly because it, it just isn't their thing. They, yeah. they don't want to conquer America. They don't want to conquer Russia. They want to be left alone. Mm. Uh, so that's, that's the whole thing about China. Mm. Yeah, and that's what I mean, though, in, in terms of this, this um, I don't know, do you think that technology in some ways... Um, it changes the cyclical nature of history. Don't you think that like perhaps now a, a stage of decline can be extended almost indefinitely because does this make sense? Like does, does, does how does um, technology influence um, that sort of cyclical view? If that makes sense as a question. Well, that is a tough question to get around because um, well, you have to look at Roman technology for a second here. So on the one hand, they invent the book, the, the Codex, where you turn pages for the first time that are hinged. So we got, so they've got that kind of technology. Then they have this technology about uh, building aqueducts and roads and the Colosseum. But how far did that get them? I mean, it, it does, it did not. Yeah, it was a grand sunset effect, but it didn't really take, you know, it didn't really save them. It didn't really get them very far. And I see the West as in, in a similar position. Yeah, we've got all these iPads and gadgets and so forth, but how far is that going to get the West Yeah, um, without spiritual ideas? And that's the whole problem. When you get to end phases of civilization, you get technological marvels, but they're now divorced from mm. spiritual ideas. And anything that is divorced from a spiritual idea isn't going to last long. It, it's just not going to go very far. So that's the whole problem. 
the the thing that I'm getting at is like to call Spengler optimistic is very strange, but in a weird way, <laughs> the, the the idea of an end. How factor, dare you? How <laughs> dare you? you you've got this idea of like uh, the phoenix rising. You know that out of the ashes something new can be born, and I guess like my great fear is that like um, perhaps technological progress can in some ways mitigate against like for for instance you know like imagine you're living in a society where you rely on peasants for labor and increasingly these people you know disillusioned frustrated so on and so forth they're not going to cooperate with you if you're living in this uh society where huge sectors of the economy are automated um where you don't really need to rely on the people I worry that that like end phase, if that makes sense, can just almost be extended indefinitely because you don't, well, to be frank, it, it, it's, it's just, is that making sense? Does that make sense to you? Yeah, yeah, it does. But um, one thing we probably haven't considered here and, and one thing that I don't think occurred to Spangler is that with the technological uh, gadgets that we have now, such as the internet, uh, and the internet is a big one. Um, for the first time ever, we can unite the entire planet. I mean, so we have actually taken the planet and put it inside of an exoskeleton of technology for the first time. So on the technological plane, uh, we've unified the entire planet, not on the spiritual plane hmm. uh, and not, well, maybe on the economic plane, maybe not, depending... But on the technological plane, we've unified the whole thing. So it's possible that from that unification, another world civilization can come into being that's planetary in scale for the first time. And that, that, that Western technology, yeah, the West is dying, but every civilization has picked up our technology and uh, we're all on the same page now with the internet I can dial up somebody in India right now. I'm talking to you in Australia. So, uh, you know, it, it, it could change things. It, it could create a singularity for the first time in history where now we have a planetary civilization, not this or that civilization, but a planetary one. And something new could come out of this that we're not, we're not seeing, that we're not seeing because we're looking at these old models Spangler, Gebser, Toynbee, we're, we're looking at old models. Maybe something is happening under our noses that we're not seeing that, that could, could create a whole new planetary yeah. civilization. That that's actually um, brings me to something I wanted to ask you, which is, do we have a mythos? And if not, um, do you see us perhaps um, adopting a new mythos within the next 50 years or whatever no we don't we don't have a single mythos right now mm -hmm. uh, th there are too many boxes india's mythos china's mythos you know uh the west th there are too many boxes that are pulling back and resisting globalization um and they each want to insist on their own mythos especially islam mm -hmm. and buddhism and uh, that's why we're getting these ethnic and religious wars, they want to go back and shut their eyes to this and pretend it never happened. But that can't go on very long because now the planet's too small for that. It, it's just too small for that. So um, all the various uh, mythologies that have animated these civilizations, Mahayana Buddhism, um, Taoism, Islam, you know, uh, Christianity, the West, you know, they're they all going to have to realize that they're living in the same time in the same place and that hybridizations are going to have to occur. And it's going to have to create something larger now that unites us all as a people. Now, take, take this example. Just think about this. Islam. What happened with Islam? Um, you get these various warring Arabic tribes, none of which can get along. And Muhammad says, the angel Gabriel just gave me a vision of how we can all get along. Here's the vision. It's a single uniting vision that will pull us all together as Arabs. In, in that case, it's ethnic. As Arabs, 
We need something like that. I think something like that could happen. We've got all these competing uh, world religions, but some Mohammed could come along and say, I see how all these can come together to form one planetary religion that could unite all of us, not just on the technological plane, but the technological infrastructure could be used mm. as a means of disseminating this single global religion that will unite all of us. So I don't know. That's that's my guess. That's my guess. It's like, um, yeah, you, you almost think about it like a, a comparison could be like, you've got the chaos, which I would say like, like you, have, you have a sort of spiritual chaos now and all sorts of chaos. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Within that, this the is going to be- The Buddhists in Myanmar yeah. can't get along with the Muslims, mm. you know, and the Muslims in Bangladesh can't get along with, with the Hindus. This is a pretty small planet now. How, how long do you think that can go on? Yeah, sure. You know? That is an interesting idea. And then you imagine that, I think that's the, the idea is that out of chaos, like a Napoleon could arise or a Muhammad, right? And, and then establish this new order. I think in some ways it, it almost feels like people are waiting for that. Uh, you know, they're waiting for something new because everything seems tired. Everything seems exhausted. Um, like Does. Um, Christianity, like, like for me, I find that, that I'm like, I, the pains of sort of secularism, uh, the alienation, so on and so forth. You, you want something else. You try to replace it with perhaps Christianity, but it just doesn't. No. It, like I've tried that, it just doesn't work. It, it feels, you walk into a church, it feels like you're walking into a funeral, you know? It, it, it yeah. sort of begins to feel like a dead religion. Um, and it feels like, yeah, you, you need something else. It's just where will that come from, I guess. Suppose, I mean, do a thought experiment. Suppose all the religions are wrong. That uh, if Christianity is right, Islam is wrong. If they're right, Buddhism is wrong. What if they're all wrong and they're all right too simultaneously? So some genius, some religious genius, some Muhammad would need to come along, Muhammad, Buddha, Christ, whatever, would need to come along and say, this is what they're all right about mm. and fuse that together. So that, um, because part of the problem is of, of, of the reason why they are the way they are is they, they keep insisting on ethnic mm. uh, ideas. Um, you know, Islam is that ethnic and Buddhism is ethnic. You know, they, they keep insisting on ethnicity, but what if all that's wrong? And they all have something correct, which is that um, there's a spiritual world. There is a real, actual spiritual world that we all come from. Mm. And um, somebody could come along and extract that core yeah. and say, here's what it is. Here's what could unite all of us. And then we would enter into a fourth generation of civilization because you know about Toynbee's model where he talks about that there are three generations of, of civilization. The first generation being the Egyptian and, and uh, Mesopotamian, they're strictly religious, no philosophy. Then the Indo-Aryan invasions take place. Then we get the second generation, which is philosophically inclined with India, Persia, China, the Greeks and the Hebrews. Then we get a third generation that comes in with the world religions of Islam, Mahayana Buddhism, and Christian, all the various Christianities, Orthodox, Western. That's the third generation. And what's interesting about that third generation is that those religions are based not on ethnicity. They're based on credo. Hmm. All you have to do is say, to, to belong to any one of those is say, I believe. Yeah. I be we don't care where you're from. You just say, I believe. But what about the possibility of a fourth generation where some religious genius comes along and says, it doesn't matter where you're from or what you believe, they're all the one truth. They're all part of the same truth. And that truth could unite us all as a civilization. Mm. Uh, I see that as a possible, what I call second axial age, 
Carl Jaspers had this idea of an axial age that took place from about 500 BC to about 200 BC, uh, where we got all these religious prophets going up across the board, you know, Pythagoras and and uh, all these prophets, the Lao Tzu, Confucius, Yojana Valkya in India. Um, what if we're entering into a second axial age where we get all these prophets, these religious prophets who are trying to unify us. And I already see evidence for this with Sri Aurobindo, Rudolf Steiner, mm. Ter Desher Dan. They all come from specific religious traditions. Aurobindo comes from the Hindu tradition, but totally reformed. He totally turns it upside down. Uh, Ter Desher Dan, Catholic priest, but a very different vision from from what the church has given us rudolf steiner uh who has synthesized christianity with uh hinduism synthesized them together to create a new vision these are the prophets that i see these kinds of guys are the prophets that i see of the possibility of a new planetary religion i think we might be headed in that direction um, I think Paglia said, Camille Paglia said that like... Uh, Paglia, yeah. the, the, G, the G in Italian is, is silent. It, it's, oh, yeah, yeah. Paglia, okay. Um, so she said um, that the humanity should revolve around comparative religion. And obviously that isn't happening within universities, but outside of the university, you do see, interestingly, this fascination in comparative religion, right? And even you yeah. someone like... Um, uh, Jordan Peterson, right, who has huge mass appeal, right, you walk into any bookstore, his books are there, and he was obviously interested in that, and, and by, so that means that, you know, you can see in the population at large, there is an interest in comparative religion, even though the institutions have sort of, um, I don't know, they, they look down on it, I, I don't think, that you, you're not learning, if you go to a university, you're probably not learning about religion in great depth, so it, it, it is interesting that maybe there's even like a sort of popular um, sentiment that is in line with this as well. Yeah, I, you know, like I say, I, I see a planetary religion coming. I, I mm -hmm. think it's going to come. I, I, it just makes sense. When, when you look at the history of the transformations of civilization, uh, a planetary religion is the only thing that makes sense now. And, and also you could you know with the degree of fracturing going on right i guess that like, like you know countries are fractured um you've pointed out various problems in different parts of the world but it's weird out of that disorder so often what happens is order right like just when when things are getting the most chaotic the most fractured is exactly the point at which um someone comes along whether it be like a muhammad or whatever and, and yep, unites. Yep. so I, I think yeah it's um that's kind of why I, I brought up before that makes me optimistic in a way it would it would be an interesting thing to see My it is worth being optimistic about it. yeah um uh the pessimism is the fact that the, the the planet is in big trouble with global warming and our cities are in big trouble because they're going to sink um there's no way around that and we're going to have a lot of displaced people refugees and so forth but on the other hand what could unite all this is a single planetary religion. And, and, I, and I think that that could produce a whole new phase of human civilization that has hitherto never happened because we've never been in this situation. Think about the world war. We've never had a world war before, mm. an entire war that involved the entire planet. Yeah. We never had that before. So, um, that may be like a harbinger of, of paving the way for something like this. We've never had a world war. We've never had a planetary religion. Maybe that's next. You know, I mean, it, it makes sense. It, it stands to reason that, you know, liberalism is perhaps the planetary religion that failed <laughs> post world. <laughs> you know, it, it's, well, yeah. As in, it was incapable of inspiring the sort of um, devotion um, that, that only a kind of religion can. Um, yeah. All right, we're coming up on an hour. I, I, I hope it's okay. I think we'll leave it there. But um, it was great to speak to you. I feel like we... Um, yeah, absolutely.
Okay. Absolutely. I, I totally enjoyed it. Yeah, that was yeah, great. Great. And I'd love to speak to you again. I, to, I feel like I learned a lot just from that. There's so, sure. So many things now that I'm going to go off and start looking into. <laughs> Any, anytime you want, just give me a buzz. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, Thank that was you. great. Lovely to speak to you. Have a nice day or night. Okay. Night. See you later. Good night. Yeah.